Chapter Twenty Nine of the Alhambra: A Series of Tales and Sketches of the Moors and Spaniards by Washington Irving. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Nine: Legend of the Two Discreet Statues. There lived once in a waste apartment of the Alhambra a merry little fellow named Lope Sanchez who worked in the gardens, and was as brisk and blithe as a grasshopper, singing all day long. He was the life and soul of the fortress. When his work was over, he would sit on one of the stone benches of the esplanade, and strum his guitar, and sing long ditties about the Cid, and Bernardo del Carpio, and Fernando del Pulgar, and other Spanish heroes, for the amusement of the old soldiers of the fortress, or would strike up a merrier tune, and set the girls dancing boleros and fandangos. Like most little men, Lope Sanchez had a strapping buxom dame for a wife, who could almost have put him in her pocket. But he lacked the usual poor man's lot. Instead of ten children, he had but one. This was a little black-eyed girl, about twelve years of age, named Sanchica, who was as merry as himself, and the delight of his heart. She played about him as he worked in the gardens, danced to his guitar as he sat in the shade, and ran as wild as a young fawn about the groves and alleys and ruined halls of the Alhambra. It was now the eve of the blessed St. John, and the holy day-loving gossips of the Alhambra, men, women, and children, went up at night to the Mountains of the Sun, which arises above the Henrelief, to keep their midsummer vigil on its level summit. It was a bright moonlight night, and all the mountains were grey and silvery, and the city, with its domes and spires, lay in shadows below, and the vega was like a fairyland, with haunted streams gleaming among its dusky groves. On the highest part of the mountain they lit up a bale-fire, according to an old custom of the country, handed down from the moors. The inhabitants of the surrounding country were keeping a similar vigil, and bale-fires here and there in the vega, and along the folds of the mountains, blazed up palely in the moonlight. The evening was gaily passed in dancing to the guitar of Lope Sanchez, who was never so joyous as when on a holiday revel of the kind. While the dance was going on, the little Sanchica, with some of her playmates, sported among the ruins of an old Moorish fort that crowns the mountain, when, in gathering pebbles in the fosse, she found a small hand, curiously carved of jet, the fingers closed and the thumb firmly clasped upon them. Overjoyed with her good fortune, she ran to her mother with her prize. It immediately became a subject of sage speculation, and was eyed by some with superstitious distrust. "'Throw it away,' said one. "'It is Moorish. Depend upon it, there's mischief and witchcraft in it.' "'By no means,' said another. "'You may sell it for something to the jewellers of the Zacatin." In the midst of this discussion an old tawny soldier drew near, who had served in Africa and was as swarthy as a moor. He examined the hand with a knowing look. "'I have seen things of this kind,' said he, "'among the moors of Barbary. It is of great value to guard against the evil eye, and all kinds of spells and enchantments. I give you joy, friend Lope. This bodes good luck to your child.' Upon hearing this, the wife of Lope Sanchez tied the little hand of jet to a ribbon, and hung it round the neck of her daughter. The sight of this talisman called up all the favorite superstitions about the Moors. The dance was neglected, and they sat in groups on the ground, telling old legendary tales handed down from their ancestors. Some of their stories turned upon the wonders of the very mountain upon which they were seated, which is a famous hobgoblin region. One ancient crone gave a long account of the subterranean palace in the bowels of that mountain, where Boabdil and all his Moslem court are said to remain enchanted. 
among yonder ruins," said she, pointing to some crumbling walls and mounds of earth on a distant part of the mountain, " there is a deep black pit, that goes down, down into the very heart of the mountain. For all the money in Granada, I would not look down into it. Once upon a time, a poor man of the Alhambra, who tended goats upon this mountain, scrambled down into that pit after a kid that had fallen in. He came out again, all wild and staring, and told such things of what he had seen that every one thought his brain was turned. He raved for a day or two about hobgoblin moors that had pursued him in the cavern, and could hardly be persuaded to drive his goats up again to the mountain. He did so at last, but, poor man, he never came down again. The neighbors found his goats browsing about the Moorish ruins, and his hat and mantle lying near the mouth of the pit, but he was never heard more of. The little Sanchica listened with breathless attention to this story. She was of a curious nature, and felt immediately a great hankering to peep into this dangerous pit. Stealing away from her companions, she sought the distant ruins, and, after groping for some time among them, came to a small hollow or basin near the brow of the mountain, where it swept steeply down into the valley of the Daro. In the centre of this basin yawned the mouth of the pit. Sanchica ventured to the verge and peeped in. All was black as pitch, and gave an idea of immeasurable depth. Her blood ran cold. She drew back, then peeped again, then would have run away, then took another peep. The very horror of the thing was delightful to her. At length she rolled a large stone and pushed it over the brink. For some time it fell in silence, then struck some rocky projection with a violent crash, then rebounded from side to side, rumbling and tumbling, with a noise like thunder then made a final splash into water, far, far below, and all was again silent. The silence, however, did not long continue. It seemed as if something had been awakened within this dreary abyss. A murmuring sound gradually rose out of the pit like the hum and buzz of a beehive. It grew louder and louder. There was the confusion of voices as of a distant multitude, together with the faint din of arms, clash of cymbals, and clangor of trumpets, as if some army were marshalling for battle in the very bowels of the mountain. The child drew off with silent awe, and hastened back to the place where she had left her parents and their companions. All were gone. The bale-fire was expiring, and its last wreath of smoke curling up in the moonshine. The distant fires that had blazed along the mountains and in the vega were all extinguished. Everything seemed to have sunk to repose. Sanchica called her parents and some of her companions by name, but received no reply. She ran down the side of the mountain and by the gardens of the Henrelief until she arrived in the alley of trees leading to the Alhambra where she seated herself on a bench of a woody recess to recover breath. The bell from the watch-tower of the Alhambra tolled midnight. There was a deep tranquillity, as if all nature slept, excepting the low tinkling sound of an unseen stream that ran under the covert of the bushes. The breathing sweetness of the atmosphere was lulling her to sleep, when her eye was caught by something glittering at a distance, and, to her surprise, she beheld a long cavalcade of Moorish warriors pouring down the mountainside and along the leafy avenues. Some were armed with lances and shields, others with scimitars and battle-axes, and with polished cuirasses that flashed in the moonbeams. Their horses pranced proudly and champed upon the bit, but their tramp caused no more sound than if they had been shod with felt, and the riders were all as pale as death. Among them rode a beautiful lady with a crowned head 
and long golden locks entwined with pearls. The housings of her palfrey were of crimson velvet embroidered with gold, and swept the earth. But she rode all disconsolate, with eyes ever fixed upon the ground. Then succeeded a train of courtiers, magnificently arrayed in robes and turbans of diverse colors, and amidst these, on a cream-colored charger, rode King Boabdil el Chico, in a royal mantle covered with jewels, and a crown sparkling with diamonds. The little Sanchica knew him by his yellow beard, and his resemblance to his portrait, which she had often seen in the picture-gallery of the Henrelief. She gazed in wonder and admiration at this royal pageant, as it passed glistening among the trees. But though she knew these monarchs, and courtiers, and warriors, so pale and silent, were out of the common course of nature, and things of magic or enchantment, yet she looked on with a bold heart. Such courage did she derive from the mystic talisman of the hand which was suspended about her neck. The cavalcade having passed by, she rose and followed. It continued on to the great gate of justice, which stood wide open. The old invalid sentinels on duty lay on the stone benches of the barbican, buried in profound and apparently charmed sleep, and the phantom pageant swept noiselessly by them with flaunting banner and triumphant state. Sanchica would have followed, but to her surprise she beheld an opening in the earth within the barbican, leading down beneath the foundations of the tower. She entered for a little distance, and was encouraged to proceed by finding steps rudely hewn in the rock, and a vaulted passage here and there lit up by a silver lamp, which, while it gave light, diffused likewise a grateful fragrance. Venturing on, she came at last to a great hall wrought out of the heart of the mountain, magnificently furnished in the Moorish style, and lighted up by silver and crystal lamps. Here on an ottoman sat an old man in Moorish dress, with a long white beard, nodding and dozing with a staff in his hand, which seemed ever to be slipping from his grasp, while at a little distance sat a beautiful lady in ancient Spanish dress, with a coronet all sparkling with diamonds, and her hair entwined with pearls, who was softly playing on a silver lyre. The little Sanchica now recollected a story she had heard among the old people of the Alhambra, concerning a Gothic princess confined in the centre of the mountain by an old Arabian magician, whom she kept bound up in magic sleep by the power of music. The lady paused with surprise at seeing a mortal in that enchanted hall. "'Is it the eve of the blessed St. John?' said she. "'It is,' replied Sanchica. "'Then for one night the magic charm is suspended. Come hither, child, and fear not, I am a Christian like thyself, though bound here by enchantment. Touch my fetters with the talisman that hangs about thy neck, and for this night I shall be free. So saying, she opened her robes and displayed a broad golden band around her waist, and a golden chain that fastened her to the ground. The child hesitated not to apply the little hand of jet to the golden band, and immediately the chain fell to the earth. At the sound the old man awoke, and began to rub his eyes, but the lady ran her fingers over the cords of the lyre, and again he fell into a slumber, and began to nod, and his staff to falter in his hand. Now, said the lady, touch his staff with the talismanic hand of jet. The child did so, and it fell from his grasp, and he sank in a deep sleep on the ottoman. The lady gently laid the silver lyre on the ottoman, leaning it against the head of the sleeping magician, then touching the cords until they vibrated in his ear. O oh, potent spirit of harmony, said she, continue thus to hold his senses in thraldom till the return of day. 
now follow me my child continued she and thou shalt behold the alhambra as it was in the days of its glory for thou hast a magic talisman that reveals all enchantments sanchica followed the lady in silence they passed up through the entrance of the cavern into the barbican of the gate of justice and thence to the plaza de las aljibas or esplanade within the fortress this was all filled with moorish soldiery horse and foot marshalled in squadrons with banners displayed there were royal guards also at the portal and rows of african blacks with drawn scimitars no one spoke a word and sanchica passed on fearlessly after her conductor her astonishment increased on entering the royal palace in which she had been reared the broad moonshine lit up all the halls and courts and gardens almost as brightly as if it were day but revealed a far different scene from that to which she was accustomed the walls of the apartments were no longer stained and rent by time instead of cobwebs they were now hung with rich silks of damascus and the gildings and arabesque paintings were restored to their original brilliancy and freshness the halls instead of being naked and unfurnished were set out with divans and ottomans of the rarest stuffs embroidered with pearls and studded with precious gems and all the fountains in the courts and gardens were playing the kitchens were again in full operation cooks were busied preparing shadowy dishes and roasting and boiling the phantoms of pullets and partridges servants were hurrying to and fro with silver dishes heaped up with dainties and arranging a delicious banquet the court of lions was thronged with guards and courtiers and alfaquis as in the old times of the moors and at the upper end in the saloon of judgment sat boabdil on his throne surrounded by his court and swaying a shadowy sceptre for the night notwithstanding all this throng and seeming bustle not a voice or footstep was to be heard nothing interrupted the midnight silence but the plashing of the fountains the little sanchica followed her conductress in mute amazement about the palace until they came to a portal opening to the vaulted passages beneath the great tower of comares on each side of the portal sat the figure of a nymph wrought out of alabaster their heads were turned aside and their regards fixed upon the same spot within the vault the enchanted lady paused and beckoned the child to her here said she is a great secret which i will reveal to thee in reward for thy faith and courage these discreet statues watch over a mighty treasure hidden in old times by a moorish king tell thy father to search the spot on which their eyes are fixed and he will find what will make him richer than any man in granada thy innocent hands alone however gifted as thou art also with a talisman can remove the treasure bid thy father use it discreetly and devote a part of it to the performance of daily masses for my deliverance from this unholy enchantment when the lady had spoken these words she led the child onward to the little garden of linaraja which is hard by the vault of the statues the moon trembled upon the waters of the solitary fountain in the centre of the garden and shed a tender light upon the orange and citron trees the beautiful lady plucked a branch of myrtle and wreathed it round the head of the child let this be a memento said she of what i have revealed to thee and a testimonial of its truth my hour is come i must return to the enchanted hall follow me not lest evil befall thee farewell remember what i have said and have masses performed for my deliverance so saying the lady entered a dark passage leading beneath the towers of comares and was no longer to be seen 
the faint crowing of a cock was now heard from the cottages below the alhambra in the valley of the daro and a pale streak of light began to appear above the eastern mountains a slight wind arose there was a sound like the rustling of dry leaves through the courts and corridors and door after door shut to with a jarring sound sanchica returned to the scenes she had so lately beheld thronged with the shadowy multitude but boabdil and his phantom court were gone the moon shone into empty halls and galleries stripped of their transient splendour stained and dilapidated by time and hung with cobwebs the bat flitted about in the uncertain light and the frog croaked from the fish-pond sanchica now made the best of her way to a remote staircase that led up to the humble apartment occupied by her family the door as usual was open for lope sanchez was too poor to need bolt or bar she crept quietly to her pallet and putting the myrtle wreath beneath her pillow soon fell asleep in the morning she related all that had befallen her to her father lope sanchez however treated the whole as a mere dream and laughed at the child for her credulity he went forth to his customary labours in the garden but had not been there long when his little daughter came running to him almost breathless father father cried she behold the myrtle wreath which the moorish lady bound round my head lope sanchez gazed with astonishment for the stalk of the myrtle was of pure gold and every leaf was a sparkling emerald being not much accustomed to precious stones he was ignorant of the real value of the wreath but he saw enough to convince him that it was something more substantial than the stuff that dreams are generally made of and that at any rate the child had dreamt to some purpose his first care was to enjoin the most absolute secrecy upon his daughter in this respect however he was secure for she had discretion far beyond her years or sex he then repaired to the vault where stood the statues of the two alabaster nymphs he remarked that their heads were turned from the portal and that the regards of each were fixed upon the same point in the interior of the building lope sanchez could not but admire this most discreet contrivance for guarding a secret he drew a line from the eyes of the statues to the point of regard made a private mark on the wall and then retired all day however the mind of lope sanchez was distracted with a thousand cares he could not help hovering within distant view of the two statues and became nervous from the dread that the golden secret might be discovered every footstep that approached the place made him tremble he would have given anything could he but turn the heads of the statues forgetting that they had looked precisely in the same direction for some hundreds of years without any person being the wiser a plague upon them he would say to himself they'll betray all did ever mortal hear of such a mode of guarding a secret then on hearing any one advance he would steal off as though his very lurking near the place would awaken suspicions then he would return cautiously and peep from a distance to see if everything was secure but the sight of the statues would again call forth his indignation ay there they stand would he say always looking and looking and looking just where they should not confound them they are just like all their sex if they have not tongues to tattle with they'll be sure to do it with their eyes at length to his relief the long anxious day drew to a close the sound of footsteps was no longer heard in the echoing halls of the alhambra the last stranger passed the threshold the great portal was barred and bolted and the bat and the frog and the hooting owl gradually resumed their nightly vocations in the deserted palace 
Lope Sanchez waited, however, until the night was far advanced, before he ventured with his little daughter to the hall of the two nymphs. He found them looking as knowingly and mysteriously as ever at the secret place of deposit. By your leaves, gentle ladies, thought Lope Sanchez, as he passed between them, I will relieve you from this charge that must have set so heavily in your minds for the last two or three centuries. He accordingly went to work at the part of the wall which he had marked, and in a little while laid open a concealed recess in which stood two great jars of porcelain. He attempted to draw them forth, but they were immovable until touched by the innocent hand of his little daughter. With her aid he dislodged them from their niche, and found to his great joy that they were filled with pieces of Moorish gold mingled with jewels and precious stones. Before daylight he managed to convey them to his chamber, and left the two guardian statues with their eyes still fixed on the vacant wall. Lope Sanchez had thus on a sudden become a rich man, but riches, as usual, brought a world of cares to which he had hitherto been a stranger. How was he to convey away his wealth with safety? How was he even to enter upon the enjoyment of it without awakening suspicion? Now, too, for the first time in his life, the dread of robbers entered into his mind. He looked with terror at the insecurity of his habitation, and went to work to barricade the doors and windows. Yet, after all his precautions, he could not sleep soundly. His usual gaiety was at an end. He had no longer a joke or a song for his neighbors, and in short became the most miserable animal in the Alhambra. His old comrades remarked this alteration, pitied him heartily, and began to desert him, thinking he must be falling into want and in danger of looking to them for assistance. Little did they suspect that his only calamity was riches. The wife of Lope Sanchez shared his anxiety, but then she had ghostly comfort. We ought before this to have mentioned that Lope, being rather a light, inconsiderate little man, his wife was accustomed in all grave matters to seek the counsel and ministry of her confessor, Fray Simon, a sturdy, broad-shouldered, blue-bearded, bullet-headed friar of the neighboring convent of San Francisco, who was, in fact, the spiritual comforter of half the good wives of the neighborhood. He was, moreover, in great esteem among diverse sisterhoods of nuns, who requited him for his ghostly services by frequent presents of those little dainties and knick-knacks manufactured in convents, such as delicate confections, sweet biscuits, and bottles of spiced cordials, found to be marvellous restoratives after fasts and vigils. Fray Simon thrived in the exercise of his functions. His oily skin glistened in the sunshine as he toiled up the hill of the Alhambra on a sultry day. Yet notwithstanding his sleek condition, the knotted rope round his waist showed the austerity of his self-discipline. The multitude doffed their caps to him as a mirror of piety, and even the dogs scented the odor of sanctity that exhaled from his garments and howled from their kennels as he passed. Such was Fray Simon, the spiritual counsellor of the comely wife of Lope Sanchez, and as the father confessor is the domestic confidant of women in humble life in Spain, he was soon made acquainted, in great secrecy, with the story of the hidden treasure. The friar opened eyes and mouth, and crossed himself a dozen times at the news. After a moment's pause, daughter of my soul, said he, know that thy husband has committed a double sin, a sin against both state and church. The treasure he has thus seized upon for himself, being found in the royal domains, belongs, of course, to the crown. But being infidel wealth, rescued as it were from the very fangs of Satan, should be devoted to the church. 
Still, however, the matter may be accommodated. Bring hither the myrtle wreath. When the good father beheld it, his eyes twinkled more than ever with admiration of the size and beauty of the emeralds. This, said he, being the first fruits of this discovery, shall be dedicated to pious purposes. I will hang it up as a votive offering before the image of San Francisco in our chapel, and will earnestly pray to him this very night that your husband be permitted to remain in quiet possession of your wealth. The good dame was delighted to make her peace with heaven at so cheap a rate, and the friar, putting the wreath under his mantle, departed with saintly steps towards his convent. When Lope Sanchez came home, his wife told him what had passed. He was excessively provoked, for he lacked his wife's devotion, and had for some time groaned in secret at the domestic visitations of the friar. "'Woman,' said he, "'what hast thou done? Thou hast put everything at hazard by thy tattling.' "'What?' cried the good woman. Would you forbid my disburdening my conscience to my confessor? No, wife, confess as many of your own sins as you please, but as to this money-digging it is a sin of my own, and my conscience is very easy under the weight of it. There was no use, however, in complaining. The secret was told, and, like water spilled on the sand, was not again to be gathered. Their only chance was that the friar would be discreet. The next day, while Lope Sanchez was abroad, there was an humble knocking at the door, and Fray Simon entered with meek and demure countenance. Daughter, said he, I have prayed earnestly to San Francisco, and he has heard my prayer. In the dead of the night the saint appeared to me in a dream but with a frowning aspect. Why, said he, dost thou pray to me to dispense with the treasure of the Gentiles, when thou seest the poverty of my chapel? Go to the house of Lope Sanchez, crave in my name a portion of the Moorish gold to furnish two candlesticks for the main altar, and let him possess the residue in peace. When the good woman heard of this vision, she crossed herself with awe, and going to the secret place where Lope had hid the treasure, she filled a great leathern purse with pieces of Moorish gold and gave it to the friar. The pious monk bestowed upon her in return benedictions enough, if paid by heaven, to enrich her race to the latest posterity. Then, slipping the purse into the sleeve of his habit, he folded his hands upon his breast and departed with an air of humble thankfulness. When Lope Sanchez heard of this second donation to the church, he had well nigh lost his senses. Unfortunate man, cried he, what will become of me? I shall be robbed by piecemeal, I shall be ruined and brought to beggary. It was with the utmost difficulty that his wife could pacify him by reminding him of the countless wealth that yet remained, and how considerate it was for San Francisco to rest contented with so very small a portion. Unluckily, Fray Simon had a number of poor relations to be provided for, not to mention some half-dozen sturdy, bullet-headed orphan children and destitute foundlings that he had taken under his care. He repeated his visits, therefore, from day to day, with salutations on behalf of St. Dominic, St. Andrew, St. James, until poor Lope was driven to despair, and found that, unless he got out of the reach of this holy friar, he should have to make peace offerings to every saint in the calendar. He determined, therefore, to pack up his remaining wealth, beat a secret retreat in the night, and make off to another part of the kingdom. Full of his project, he bought a stout mule for the purpose, and tethered it in a gloomy vault underneath the tower of the seven floors. 
the very place from whence the ballado or goblin horse without a head is said to issue forth at midnight and to scour the streets of granada pursued by a pack of hell-hounds lope sanchez had little faith in the story but availed himself of the dread occasioned by it knowing that no one would be likely to pry into the subterranean stable of the phantom steed he sent off his family in the course of the day with orders to wait for him at a distant village of the vega as the night advanced he conveyed his treasure to the vault under the tower and having loaded his mule he led it forth and cautiously descended the dusky avenue honest lope had taken his measures with the utmost secrecy imparting them to no one but the faithful wife of his bosom by some miraculous revelations however they became known to fray simon the zealous friar beheld these infidel treasures on the point of slipping for ever out of his grasp and determined to have one more dash at them for the benefit of the church and san francisco accordingly when the bells had rung for animas and all the alhambra was quiet he stole out of his convent and descending through the gate of justice concealed himself among the thickets of roses and laurels that border the great avenue here he remained counting the quarters of hours as they were sounded on the bell of the watch-tower and listening to the dreary hootings of owls and the distant barkings of dogs from the gypsy caverns at length he heard the tramp of hoofs and through the gloom of the overshadowing trees imperfectly beheld a steed descending the avenue the sturdy friar chuckled at the idea of the knowing turn he was about to serve honest lope tucking up the skirts of his habit and wriggling like a cat watching a mouse he waited until his prey was directly before him when darting forth from his leafy covert and putting one hand on the shoulder and the other on the crupper he made a vault that would not have disgraced the most experienced master of equitation and alighted well forked astride the steed aha said the sturdy friar we shall now see who best understands the game he had scarce uttered the words when the mule began to kick and rear and plunge and then set off at full speed down the hill the friar attempted to check him but in vain he bounded from rock to rock and bush to bush the friar's habit was torn to ribbons and fluttered in the wind his shaven pole received many a hard knock from the branches of the trees and many a scratch from the brambles to add to his terror and distress he found a pack of seven hounds in full cry at his heels and perceived too late that he was actually mounted upon the terrible ballado away they went according to the ancient phrase pull devil pull friar down the great avenue across the plaza nueva along the zacatin around the viva rambla never did huntsman and hound make a more furious run or more infernal uproar in vain did the friar invoke every saint in the calendar and the holy virgin into the bargain every time he mentioned a name of the kind it was like a fresh application of the spur and made the ballado bound as high as a house through the remainder of the night was the unlucky fray simon carried hither and thither and whither he would not until every bone in his body ached and he suffered a loss of leather too grievous to be mentioned at length the crowing of a cock gave the signal of returning day at the sound the goblin steed wheeled about and galloped back for his tower again he scoured the viva rambla the zacatin the plaza nueva and the avenue of the fountains the seven dogs yelling and barking and leaping up and snapping at the heels of the terrified friar the first streak of day had just appeared as they reached the tower here the goblin steed kicked up his heels sent the friar a somerset through the air 
plunged into the dark vault followed by the infernal pack, and a profound silence succeeded to the late deafening clamour. Was ever so diabolical a trick played off upon Holy Friar? A peasant, going to his labours at early dawn, found the unfortunate Fray Simon lying under a fig-tree at the foot of the tower, but so bruised and bedeviled that he could neither speak nor move. He was conveyed, with all care and tenderness, to his cell, and the story went that he had been waylaid and maltreated by robbers. A day or two elapsed before he recovered the use of his limbs. He consoled himself in the meantime with the thoughts that, though the mule with the treasure had escaped him, he had previously had some rare pickings at the infidel spoils. His first care on being able to use his limbs was to search beneath his pallet, where he had secreted the myrtle wreath and the leathern pouches of gold extracted from the piety of Dame Sanchez. What was his dismay at finding the wreath in effect but a withered branch of myrtle, and the leathern pouches filled with sand and gravel? Fray Simon, with all his chagrin, had the discretion to hold his tongue, for to betray the secret might draw on him the ridicule of the public and the punishment of his superior. It was not until many years afterwards, on his deathbed, that he revealed to his confessor his nocturnal ride on the Belado. Nothing was heard of Lope Sanchez for a long time after his disappearance from the Alhambra. His memory was always cherished as that of a merry companion, though it was feared from the care and melancholy showed in his conduct shortly before his mysterious departure that poverty and distress had driven him to some extremity. Some years afterwards, one of his old companions, an invalid soldier, being at Malaga, was knocked down and nearly run over by a coach and six. The carriage stopped, an old gentleman, magnificently dressed, with a bag-wig and sword, stepped out to assist the poor invalid. What was the astonishment of the latter to behold in this grand cavalier his old friend Lope Sanchez, who was actually celebrating the marriage of his daughter Sanchica with one of the first grandees in the land. The carriage contained the bridal party. There was Dame Sanchez, now grown as round as a barrel, and dressed out with feathers and jewels, and necklaces of pearls, and necklaces of diamonds, and rings on every finger, and altogether a finery of apparel that had not been seen since the days of Queen Sheba. The little Sanchica was now grown to be a woman, and for grace and beauty might have been mistaken for a duchess, if not a princess outright. The bridegroom sat beside her, rather a withered, spindle-shanked little man, but this only proved him to be of the true blood a legitimate Spanish grandee, being rarely above three cubits in stature. The match had been of the mother's making. Riches had not spoiled the heart of honest Lope. He kept his old comrade with him for several days, feasted him like a king, took him to plays and bullfights, and at length sent him away rejoicing with a big bag of money for himself, and another to be distributed among his ancient messmates of the Alhambra. Lope always gave out that a rich brother had died in America, and left him heir to a copper mine, but the shrewd gossips of the Alhambra insist that his wealth was all derived from his having discovered the secret guarded by the two marble nymphs of the Alhambra. It is remarked that these very discreet statues continue even unto the present day with their eyes fixed most significantly on the same part of the wall, which leads many to suppose there is still some hidden treasure remaining there, well worth the attention of the enterprising traveller. Though others, and particularly all female visitors, regard them with great complacency, 
as lasting monuments of the fact that women can keep a secret. End of chapter 29